Hi everyone. In this video, I am going to talk about how to approach motor vehicle accident scenario and that was the exam. I would like to add disclaimer statement here. This video is for educational purposes only. A possible scenario that could come in this exam would be 36 years old man presented in ED has suffered a head trauma in a motor vehicle collision. Please initiate appropriate management. So it may come as a 10 minute management station but it could be divided as 8 minutes for history and examination and 3 minutes for post income. As this is the trauma case, we will activate ATLS and the first priority is to do the primary survey. If patient is responsive and conscious, introduce yourself, confirm patient name and age. There are two major goals of primary survey. One is to identify life-threatening injuries quickly and two is to provide stabilization when life threats are identified. Primary survey involves simultaneous assessment and treatment of the patient to ensure they remain stable and life threats are quickly addressed. Primary survey follows same order every time you see a trauma patient. It begins with airway, followed by breathing, then circulation, disability, and lastly, exposure of patient and assessment of environment. So when we talk about airway, the first thing to do is to stabilize C-spine. If patient is wearing cervical collar, proceed to the next step. If not, ask the patient not to move his or her head and immobilize C-spine with the cervical collar. Next is to talk with the patient, ask some questions like how you are feeling, what happened, etc. That would give you a clue about current or impending airway obstruction. If patient cannot talk, ask yourself why and proceed to the definitive airway treatment that is intubation if there is no facial injury or fracture. Now we gonna move on to breathing. When you are assessing patient breathing, look for nasal clearing, chest movement, respiratory rate, and effort. Auscultate chest for bilateral, for presence of bilateral breath sounds, air entry, any added sound. In addition to this, feel for tracheal tug, chest wall capitation, flail chest, and subcutaneous MIC. When we are assessing breathing, we are looking for four major life threatening. Um, chest trauma injuries and the most serious and common injuries tension hemothorax and open hemothorax, massive hemothorax and flail chest. So if you identified any of these conditions, manage right away to stabilize the patient. Whenever we su suspect patient has compromised their breathing, we initiate supplemental oxygen. The aim is to keep oxygen saturation above 95%. When patient stabilizes, get checks if so to evaluate needs. Moving on to circulation. Circulatory insufficiency is very common with trauma. First thing we want to look for is patient's overall appearance, level of consciousness, skin color, capillary refill, feel for peripheral pulses, and look for external bleeding and of course hook up a cardiac monitor to check for blood pressure and pulse after every 5 to 15 minutes and watch carefully for pushing response and to try to differentiate between hemorrhagic shock and neuro neurogenic shock. In addition, we want to make sure that patient has adequate IV access. That means two large bore peripheral IVs in each arm. In the meantime, withdraw blood samples, initiate fluid, and always start with isotonic crystalline, generally normal saline or regular lactate for most patients. We might consider going straight to blood transfusion if you don't get a satisfactory response from crystalline and if there is continued bleeding. While we are managing circulation, control any obvious bleeding problem by applying direct pressure to get bleeding under control. Alright, moving on to our disability assessment. So once we cover A, B, C, the next thing we want to think about is patient's neurological status.
So we always want to formally assess their level of consciousness by using GCS slash glaucoma scan. While we are doing our neurologic survey, we always want to look at the pupils. Pupillary function gives us a sense of whether the patient has focal neurologic lesion or not. We want to look for extremity movement to make sure that there is no evidence of neurologic locality that might suggest a brain or a spinal cord injury. We want to look for external signs of head or neck trauma that might point us in the direction of significant head or neck injury. And lastly, if patient is in any way, shape or form or effect, we want to check for glucose. People with medical illness become hypoglycemic, get confused and crash their car. There are a number of neurologic conditions we are looking for during primary survey and that include any type of penetrating cranial injury, diffuse axonal injury, high speed, high spinal cord injuries like C-spine injuries, intracranial hemorrhage. Lastly, after we covered A, B, C, D, we want to think about exposing the patient. This is really, really important to take all covering off because we don't want to miss any injuries. Also, we also we want to make sure to avoid hypothermia because hypothermia can cause coagulopathy and exacerbate bleeding in trauma patients. So make sure to keep them warm and provide warm blanket or radiant heaters. So once patient is hemodynamically and neurologically stabilized during primary survey, this third secondary survey to identify major injuries or area of concern. Secondary survey consists of history and full physical examination and x-rays. So first take a look at the history and this is we call sample history to get pertinent information in a very short time. If patient is unconscious, take cool literal history from family, EMS personnel, bystanders, etc. So here S stands for signs and symptoms. So make sure to ask all the neurological signs and symptoms to assess severity of head injury. And that include headache, nausea, vomiting, changes in vision, dizziness, tinnitus, changes in level of consciousness, seizure, altered sensation, weakness, paralysis, fecal or urinary incontinence. In addition to this, ask about behavioral, emotional or cognitive disturbances. Next, A stands for allergies, M obviously stands for medication, P is all past medical stuff like past medical history, past surgical history, etc. L is for last pain because we want to know when the patient has taken or eaten something. So E stands for events surrounding the incident. This is obviously the most important part because mechanism of injury can reveal what kind of injury we are looking for. So ask some of the questions about uh, the circumstances of the collision that include um, vehicles involved, their weight and size, speed, type of the damage and location of the patient in vehicle like patient was on the driving seat or passenger seat, whether the seat belt was on or not, and were the airbags deployed or not, patient was ejected or entrapped under vehicles, or in case of motor vehicle collision, ask about helmet use. So moving on to mechanism of injuries, there are four types of road accident, head-on collision, T-bone collision, rear end collision, also called the flash injury and rollover. In head-on collision, head, facial, thoracic, or aortic, lower extremity injuries are more common. In T-bone collision, head, C-spine, thoracic, abdominal, pelvic, and lower extremities injuries are common. Whereas in rear-ended collision, hyperextension of C-spine is very common, and weaker rollover can cause multiple organ injuries. Now let's look at the physical, full physical examination and do a head-to-toe survey. 
So on the head, look for open or depressed fracture, obvious deformity, presence of his elf laceration. Identify signs of basic skull fracture that are periorbital ecchymosis, also called retinitis. Mastoid ecchymosis, also called retinal sign, and CSF primary. Inspect eye for subconjunctival hemorrhage, perform fundoscopy for pepper edema, palpate for any deformities or cervical tenderness. Next, do a complete detailed neurological examination, assess level of consciousness using Glasgow Command Scale, do a full cranial nerve examination, gross fine motor evaluation that includes muscle, power, tone, and bulk, check superficial deep tendon reflexes, do sensory examination including pain, light touch, vibration, temperature, and proprioception. Several examinations include decidual uh, carbonesia, finger nose test, heel chin test, from test. If possible, do a gait evaluation and check for signs of increased intracranial. Moving on to initial investigations and we want to do laboratory investigations and diagnostic imaging. Non contrast CT head is the best imaging modality for intracranial injury. Refer to Canadian CT handles and we will do it when the patient is stable. Okay, moving on to management. Goal of care in ED is to reduce secondary injury, injury by avoiding hypoxia, ischemia, reduce cerebral perfusion pressure, and shisha. Journal management include continuous monitoring of airway breathing circulation, ensure oxygen delivery through intubation, and prevent hypertension. Maintain blood pressure, systolic blood pressure above 90, and uh, treat other injuries. So for a minor head injury like traumatic brain injury, also called concussion, we provide symptomatic management and uh, advice for close observation and follow-up. Provide 24 hours protocol to competent caregiver if minor head injury not requiring admission. Also advise patients to follow up with neurology for any deficit because even seemingly minor head injury will cause lasting deficit. Give early neurosurgical consultation for acute and subsequent patient management. Admit patient in neurosurgical ICU if severe head injury. If there are signs of increased intracranial pressure, administer medical 1 gram per kg IV followed by surgery. Provide seizure treatment or prophylaxis. Provide pain control and sedation if necessary. If there are any laceration and you are unsure about and patient is unsure about tetanus thoxoid, give a tetanus shot. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope this will help you in your OSI exam operation. Good luck.